caffeine, high concentration. At about 8 on the night of February 27, 1943, the Norwegians pulled on white camouflage shoes, shouldered their 50-pound packs, put on skis, and started for Vamor. The weather was overcast, Ronberg later reported, mild with much wind. They glided down a mountain and into a forest, thick with bushes and low branches. They had to take off their skis and trudge on foot through the wet snow. We sank in the snow up to our waist, Ronberg said. Klaus Helberg led the way out of the trees and back into the faint moonlight. They put their skis back on and continued. Soon they could hear the low, steady hum of machinery, the Vamor plant. When they came near the edge of the gorge, they could see it. The great seven-story factory building bulked large on the landscape, Hockler later said. The Colossus lay like a medieval castle built in the most inaccessible place, protected by precipices and rivers. They slid downhill toward a road running along the top of the gorge. They were about to cross when the flash of headlights suddenly lit the snow at their feet. The men dove away from the road as two buses rounded a curb and sped past, carrying night shift workers to Baymore. At about 10 o'clock, they reached the spot from which they would descend into the gorge. In silence, they took off their skis and hid them under pine trees. They removed their white camouflage suits, revealing British military uniforms. They wanted the Germans to know they were soldiers on an official Allied mission. That way, hopefully, the Germans wouldn't retaliate against Norwegian civilians in nearby towns. Then they started down the gorge. Hanging from the branches of the trees growing out of the rocky gorge face, the men slid and tumbled down toward the river. As they got closer, they saw big cracks in the melting river ice and areas of free-flowing water. They stepped lightly across, splashing through three inches of water sitting atop the slushy surface. When they reached the far side, each man lifted an arm and grabbed a rock on the steep gorge wall. With his hand, Ronberg gave a, the go signal. The men pulled themselves up the 600-foot rock face, inch by inch. With hands and feet, they felt for tree branches or cracks in the rock. When the fiery pain in their muscles became unbearable, they clung to the side of the cliff and rested, thinking of what their trainers in Britain had taught them. Never look down. A few minutes before midnight, all ten men reached a ledge just below the plant. They gathered, panting and sweating, and waited a few minutes for their hearts to stop pounding. All right, men, said Ronberg. Let's get closer. The covering party, commanded by Nut Hocklid, led the way to the storage shed 500 yards from the plant. The roar of machines covered the slap of their boots on the wet snow. From behind the shed, the men looked out at the suspension bed, bridge leading across the gorge. Two German guards holding rifles paced the narrow bridge. They never looked toward the gorge, assuming no one could come in that way. The team dashed toward an iron fence surrounding the plant. There was a gate locked with a chain and, a pa and padlock. Hocklet and Arnie Kelger ran ahead with heavy wire cutters, cut through the chain, and swung open the gate. Hocklet, Klostrup, and the rest of the covering party went in first, taking assigned positions around the outside of the plant. Then the demolition team raced in. The hum of the machinery was steady and normal, said Ronberg. There was a good light from the moon with no one in sight except our men, our own men. Ronberg led the team to the door of the plant nearest to their target, the high concentration room in which the heavy water equipment did its work. He tried the door. Locked, he whispered. The plant's windows were covered with black paint, blocking life from escaping and making the building nearly invisible to enemy bombers. Ronberg put his face to the glass, threw thin scratches in the paint, he could see down to the high concentration room. A single Norwegian worker sat at a desk writing in a book. Ronberg sent three team members to try the other doors while he and Frederick Kaiser started looking for the air duct. Here it is, he whispered. Ronberg climbed in first. The space was too narrow for him to turn and look back, but he knew Kaiser was behind him. He could hear the man's breathing. Flashlight in hand, Ronberg crawled through the duct. From studying technical drawings of the plant, he knew that he had about 30 yards to go. Suddenly, he was startled by a loud metal crack. A pistol had dropped from Kaiser's belt and smacked the duct floor. Both men froze. Through seams in the duct, 
they could see the Norwegian worker at his desk. He never looked up from his book. Reaching an inner hallway, Ronberg removed a grate covering an open, opening in the duct. He and Kaiser lowered themselves to the floor. Drawing their pistols, they tiptoed to the door of the high concentration room. A sign on the door read, No admittance except on business. Ronberg smiled. He reached for the doorknob. The door was unlocked. The Norwegian workman looked up from his notebook as Ronberg and Kaiser opened the door. On your feet! Hands up! shouted Kaiser, pointing the, his gun. Nothing will happen to you if you do as you are told. Ronberg set down his pack and began pulling out snake-shaped explosive charges, each about a foot long. He put on rubber gloves to prevent static electricity from jumping from his skin to the fuses. Then he looked over the 18 heavy water machines. They looked exactly like the ones he'd trained on back in Britain. Ronberg had wrapped the charges around the half machines when the sound of shattering glass broke his focus. He, torn, he turned toward a window high up on the wall. Peering down through the window frame was the face of Berger Stronsheim, part of the demolition party. Stronsheim had been unable to find the air duct. Knowing the smashing sound could have alerted the German guards, Ronberg quickly pulled pieces of broken glass from the frame, slicing open his hand. He wrapped a, a handkerchief around the gash as Stronsheim climbed down into the room. Together, the two set the remaining charges and connected them to a single 30-second fuse. All right, Ronberg said, blood dripping from his hand as he pointed to the night worker. Let's get that door to the yard unlocked. The night worker put a key in the lock and turned it. Kaiser reached forward and opened the door a crack, just to make sure. It's not that I don't trust you, he said. I'm just not allowed to trust anybody. I understand, said the worker. Ronberg struck a match and held it to the fuse. Wait, please, cried the worker. My eyeglasses, they're on the table. I need them for my job. They're almost impossible to replace these days. Cringing, Ronberg blew out the match. He hurried to the desk, picked up the man's glasses case, and threw it to him. He lit another match and bent toward the fuse. I beg you wait, shouted the worker. My glasses, they are not in the case. Biting back fury, Ronberg blew out the second match. Where are your damn glasses? The worker pointed to the desk. Ronberg ran back over, shuffled through the papers, found them, and handed them to the man. A thousand thanks, said the worker. Ronberg lit a third match and held it to the fuse. Go, he shouted. Run! Run as fast as you can! The time seemed long to us who stood waiting outside, remembered Ned Hocklid. We knew that the blowing up party was inside to carry out its part of the work but we did not know how things were going. Hocklet had a, held a pistol and grenades. Next to him stood Jens Polson with his finger on the trigger of a machine gun. What could be holding them up? Polson whispered. I wish I knew. Then it came. The sound of an explosion. The windows around the high concentration room blew out. They felt a rush of air race past them. The door of the German soldier's barracks opened and a soldier stepped out with a rifle in one hand and a flashlight in the other. Shall I fire? asked Polson. Not yet, said Hocklid. The soldier swung his light across the snowy ground around the plant. Hocklid and Polson stood with their backs flat against the shed just out of view. The soldier turned back towards the barracks. Ronberg and the demolition team came racing toward Hocklid. Together, they ran out the open gate and gathered about 300 yards from the fence. The Germans still don't seem to know what's happened, Hocklid said. All ten men scrambled down the gorge. They slid from one, icy, one wet icy rock to another, resting briefly on thin ledges and continuing their slip, the slippery descent. At the bottom of the gorge, the ice on the river had continued melting. Big chunks were now spinning in the rushing black water. The men were leaping from chunk to chunk when the scream of Van Mork's sirens ripped through the air. It was as if we were being pursued across the river by the shrieking sound itself, Ronberg reported. We slipped and fell, grabbing onto the rocks and blocks of ice. They made it across and immediately started up the far side of the gorge. They reached the top and ducked back down just as the car raced past on the road in front of them. Then they crossed the road found their skis and poles, 
jumped into the white camouflage suits and sped across the snow away from the road. German cars and trucks kept zipping past us, remembered Jens Polson. That was all to the good. Those Nazis were in too much of a hurry to get to Weimar to look right or left as they raced along. The Gunnerside team split up, most heading on skis to the Swedish border, 250 miles to the northeast. Nut Hockland and Arne Kjellstrup stayed behind in Norway to help organize the anti-German resistance. They skied to a mountain hut, found radio equipment that had been stashed by other resistance fighters, and wrote out a short coded message for London. High concentration installation at the Weimar completely destroyed on the night of 27-28. Gunnerside has gone to Sweden. Then they headed deeper into the wilderness. You can bet the Germans are in a fury, Hochlid told Kelstrup, and you can bet, be sure that they'll search every corner of the mountains. Only later did Hochlid learn how right he was. Enraged German commanders were already sending out a 10,000-man German force to track down the saboteurs. Not a single one of the Norwegians was ever caught.